Welcome to the Three Forms Podcast, a joint production of Beaver Dam Christian Reformed Church and Coopersville CRC. Together we are touring our historic three forms of unity, the Belgic Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort. Considering how these old and trusted paths can equip and lead God's people in the midst of today's challenges. So let's start this week's episode. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Pastor Lloyd Hemstreet. And I am Reverend Tyler Wagamaker. And we are on episode 12, Lord's Day 12 of the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, continuing to explore the work of Jesus, God's Son. And especially in the context now of another name, we looked at the name Jesus last Lord's Day, now we look at the name Christ associated with Jesus. Hark! Hark! (laughs) Another Christmas kind of hymn, Carol, Lloyd, is Hark! The Herald Angels Sing, and at the end... It uh, of that phrase it goes, Christ is born in Bethlehem. That's that's Christ. Right. right. Uh, that is the the message, of course, that the angels did bring to the shepherds out in the field about Christ, Christ the Lord. And so, well, what is this Christ? This name and the catechism addresses that. That's where we're going today. So we'll jump right into question thirty-one. Question thirty-one: Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? And the answer the Catechism gives is because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance, our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father, and our eternal King who governs us by his word and spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. So three offices we get identified here that Jesus is anointed to, prophet, priest, and king, but chief prophet, only high priest, eternal king. Yeah, he's not just one of many in these uh, different offices. He's the one who rules over all, the the one who is set apart uh, over all the examples that came before throughout the Old Testament, God's people were looking for a king, uh, begging for a king, uh, settled for a king mm-hmm. instead of the Lord leading them, but they were looking for kings. They needed the prophets that God sent, and they had priests that were given the task of interceding and providing the sacrifices that God commanded for them all throughout the Old Testament, but they were all just a shadow in all three of these offices of Jesus Christ, in the one who was the completed each of these these offices. And there were some amazing prophets, amazing high priests, some amazing kings in the Old Testament. It's true. But even for the amazing ones, they had their sin problems. They had their shortcomings. They had their failings. Even one like uh, a King David, who in many ways was actually had expressions of all these different offices. I think about 2 Samuel chapter 7, when when it starts out, David is is being called upon. He, he looks at uh, things, he says, after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. And so what did David set out to do? He's like, I need to build a temple for the Lord. And so even in like a place like 2 Samuel is up chapter 7, where you see David, this great, amazing king. You also see he composes a song and a prayer to God, and there's a lot of prophetic language in there about even the future of what is to be unfolded and how God's people will be his people forever and how God will establish this throne, this kingship of David, which ultimately we know is is established and fulfilled supremely in Jesus Christ. And then you see David, for instance, he when the Ark of the Covenant there is brought in in the previous chapter into Jerusalem, and David is dancing, and he's singing out there with everyone else, offering up praises, and a very priestly sort of thing, this sacrifice almost. And there were actual sacrifices that were offered up too, while the, the, the Ark of the Covenant's brought in. And then and then you see in David in, in 2 Samuel chapter 8, uh, he does a lot of kingly work also too. He goes out and he kills a lot of his enemies. Um, uh, very kind of, it's not PC, but that's what kings would do. And we'll get to that too when we talk about kings. Right, right. And so we see all these ways that 
David was one of those who was foreshadowing this one who would come that would fulfill all these roles of prophet, priest, and king uh, completely. Uh, yeah, the Catechism talks about how it means Christ, meaning anointed. And uh, one of the, the places in Scripture that talks about that anointing that was on Jesus for this specific work that he was fulfilling for his people is in the book of Luke, uh, chapter 4. Uh, Luke chapter 4, of course, this is following uh, the, the temptations. And in verse 18, it begins with, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set the, at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is one of those passages that talks about that anointing that was on Jesus Christ to fulfill for his people, to provide for his people, and to uh, give them what they stood in need of in, in these roles as, as king and defending the people of God, in these roles as, as of, of, of priest and restoring them to their relationship with God, and in the role of prophet, uh, proclaiming the year of the kingdom, the, the truth of God's word that they needed to understand and receive and repent and, and follow therein. Yes, the and this anointing is just a, all it is is a, I don't want to say all, but it is a calling from God to these offices. And so it is God saying, you're going to serve me in this way. Um, you know, even let's say when David, for instance, again, going back to David, when he was anointed with oil by the prophet Samuel, God moved Samuel to do this, so calling from God on David to this. And so this sort of language, this is Old Testament language that's brought into the New Testament, this anointing, this being called by God. And and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was called to these important offices, three major offices that are found um, throughout the Old Testament and now into the New Testament as well. So yep. chief prophet, Jesus is chief prophet and teacher. Yep. And as such, he perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel of the will of God for our de deliverance. This is what Jesus has come to do, to show us the way of salvation, the way that God had planned before the foundation of the world that he was going to save and redeem his people. Uh, you know, uh, the, the book of Peter talks about the wonder of salvation, how uh, the angels desire to look into and explore and mm. are just standing in awe of what God has done and all the work that he accomplished to go ahead and save his people from their sins. And this is what Jesus reveals to his people. He shows us the plan that God has put in place for our salvation. The... Uh... That's one of the things, again, a prophet would do. We were talking about this, actually, Lloyd, in my reform, high school reform doctrine class just this past Sunday with our high schoolers, just dealing with the issue of these three these three um, offices of Jesus Christ. And, you know, we, we like to get in, in meaty stuff here in our catechism class for our high schoolers. By the way, let it not be said that high schoolers can't, that, this, that these things are over the head of, of high schoolers. That's nonsense. You give them a bar, the bar that you expect of them, and you expect of them to be able to learn this and to grasp this and understand this, and they can. They rise to the occasion. You, you talk to them. You, you explain it. You talk it through, and they grasp these things. They understand it. So this idea a lot of times like, oh, this is just too complicated for, you know, for, for school-age kids, high schoolers. That's nonsense, Lloyd. I, I see that every day here that... Uh, that these high school students are able to grasp these things and understand it and intelligibly talk about it, like the three offices of Jesus Christ. Right. And that's what, I mean, that is what God's Word said, uh, that Jesus was coming. That's why, uh, as, as he says in John 15, he was going to send the, the Spirit to come and point them to the truth, that, to remind them of all he said, so that they would get it, so that they would see and so that they would understand and be able to grasp uh, our salvation in Christ. Uh, second, he is our priest, our high priest, who has uh, set us free by the one sacrifice of his body, and who continually pleads our cause with the Father, our eternal King. Yeah, Jesus is the one high, uh, the one who comes as the high priest to offer the once-for-all sacrifice. Uh, 
there were a bunch of priests all throughout the Old Testament. There were a bunch of priests even into the start of the New Testament. We learned something about that they would take turns and by rotation mm-hmm. and because the sacrifices had to continue. The sacrifices had to be made over and over again. As the book of Hebrews said, mm-hmm. the yes. blood had to keep being spilled because God's people kept on sinning. Jesus is the uh, chief high priest, uh, the, the chief priest, because he was able to provide a once-for-all sacrifice on behalf of his people. Salvation in that he was able to accomplish is, is so much fuller than anything that these other priests could try. They were only instructed to do these things to point towards the salvation that the, the high priest, the chief priest, Christ, would accomplish for his people. It's interesting, again, I think about the Roman Catholic Church, and you know, we talked a little bit about that last Lord's Day, and they're not addressed here, but they call their their ministers priests, and in many ways it's because they offer up that sacrifice at the when they they have the Eucharist. And, and you know, I'm led to believe, again, when I see this in many ways, that, uh, again, Jesus Christ is that one only, uh, you know, that once for all, no more sacrifices need to be made up. Jesus Christ is that one, and he's our only high priest. I kind of like that, That again, Jesus Christ, I know we all, we, and we'll get this to the next question and answer, we all have the different offices we live into, a prophet, priest, and king, but that Jesus Christ is our high priest. And I don't want to be called a priest, for instance. I like being called a, a minister, the word that I get to talk about Jesus. I, I minister, uh, and and I preach. You know, preacher sometimes I preach about Jesus. Um, I get to reference Him, who is our our only high priest, for instance. So I'm glad that we are not called priests, for instance, Lloyd. Right. Then the third office that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ has is that of the eternal King. He is our eternal King, who goes ahead and governs by His Word and Spirit, and guards and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. All right, so first part of it is that he goes ahead and he governs. He's the one who is sovereign. Uh, You know, in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, uh, Jesus declares that he's been given a little bit of power and he's given a a little bit of authority, right, Uh, Tyler? That's what what Jesus says there, he he's, he got a little bit of authority. Oh, yes, just just only a slight little bit. Yes, of course, Lloyd, yes. Let's just keep moving on this, this track of error, shall we? Yes. <laughs> well, no, actually, in verse 18, he starts out with the declaration, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It is not just that his kingship is in heaven and on earth things are being battled out and, you know, the, the wicked rule of the day or the, the ruler of the power of the air, as, as it talks about in other places in Scripture. No, all authority in heaven and on earth belong to Jesus Christ right now. He is the king who is ruling and reigning over all these things. Are all people and all things in subjection to the one king? No, not perfectly by any means, but that does not change the his position and the authority that he's been given as he rules and reigns over all things. Kings are, uh, it's a great office. We don't have kings, of course, here in the United States. We've kind of had a step back from kings. We can certainly envision kings. There's lots of shows and documentaries about, about kings. So we understand on some level what kings do. But one of the things that kings do, and the catechism kind of brings this out, it, who guards us and keeps us. A, a king fights I mean, the king was supposed to be the head of the army. The king was the one who led the army out into, into battle, into victory. And so that's what King Jesus does. He leads in, you know, lead on, O King Eternal. Is right. that him? You know, we yep. have a lot of great hymns. And he is a king. He's he's fighting for us. You know, I go back to like King David, again, back in Second Samuel. Way. That's just one example of a king that... You know, David also defeated the Moabites, and he laid them. Lie, he made them lie down on the ground and measured them off with a length of cord. Every two lengths of them were put to death, and the third length was allowed to live. So the Moabites became subject to David and brought tribute. And then it goes later on with the Arameans, and and also too it goes on with the Edomites. And and the, you know, David is a king. He's bringing the enemies of God's people to bear. And sometimes you're like, oh, especially today's sensibilities are like, oh, but that's what kings would do. They would they would defeat the enemies, right? And they would safeguard uh, the people yeah. and, and keep them safe. And that's what exactly right. Jesus Christ does. He and defeats the enemies 
and he safeguards us as his people. He and and he leads us into victory on that too. And eventually, when Jesus Christ comes again in glory on that that last great day, he'll be coming as that that glorious, powerful king on that white stallion. And he'll be coming to lead the armies of heaven to victory here and all the the final foes of, of the evil one, the kingdom of this world, the kings of this world, and the rebellions and the principalities will be cast aside, cast into the lake of fire. All those among men who've shaken their fists at God and, and not come under the kingship, the lordship of Jesus Christ, will be cast in the lake of fire. That's what happens when you're the wrong side of a powerful king. Right, it is. And he is the one who is the king, the eternal king who rules over all, keeping us and, by like, freedom. I like how it says he governs us by his word and spirit, too. Yeah. So because we're not having apparitions, it's, you know, the Monty Python kind of thing all of a sudden, where all of a sudden the, the king appears in the cloud and uh, it's like God the king, and he's speaking to them. And we're like, oh, uh, Jesus doesn't appear to us that way. Jesus comes to us through his word. That's why God's word is so important, the Bible. And the Holy Spirit uses that. He sent us his spirit, and he leads us in that. So, But you don't divorce the spirit from the word. Uh, there are those who, and, and even in Christian Reform circles and other ones, who say, well, we just have to follow the spirit. As if the Spirit leads us um, contrary to the Word, as if Jesus is going to lead us in a different direction than his Word. They go hand in hand right. um, on there. And so that's important that we as God's people are in the Word so that our King can lead us. Absolutely. And as he is leading us, uh, then we can move into question 32, I think, at that transition point. Uh, so we understand why he is called Christ, meaning anointed, because he is our chief priest, our, our, our chief prophet, high priest, and eternal king. But the question is 32, but why are you called a Christian? And the answer it gives is, because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I'm anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. So Lord's Day 12, Lloyd, is a lot of times I like to say it's a job description kind of Lord's Day. Question and answer 31 is the job description for Christ, this Christ being anointed one, prophet, priest, and king. There's a job description. This is how you know he's the Christ. This is what he does. The prophet does, the, the chief, high, only high priest and our eternal king. Question and answer 32 is also a job description. It's our job description for us. What's the job being a Christian? Okay, so this is what it means to be anointed, to be called to this job. Um, we, too, do the work of prophet. We, too, do the work of priest. We, too, do the work of a king. And the catechism really wonderfully brings that out. It's good to have job descriptions. It, it is. It, it shows you the pattern of the expectations. What uh, Am I supposed to be the... the uh, uh, the, the high priest that goes ahead and, and sacrifices myself to save myself? No, that is Christ's job description. That's his expectation. But there is the op this opportunity, this blessed calling that I'm given to now present myself to him as a living sacrifice. That's my priestly work that is part of my job description. Yes, and then same thing with per on the prophetic side. My job description is to confess the name of Jesus Christ wherever I go. That's the evangelism. Uh, aspect of the Christian life of the church is supposed to do that. It's and the, it's the living out of salt and, and light in the world, yeah, the, great the preserving of effect that we all are called to be in as well. That That's part of that living it out. Yes, and then be, and part of that salt and light is also being the, this kingship, um, striving. This is this fighting again. I'm I'm supposed to fight against sin and the devil in in this life. In my own in my own personal life, it's a constant daily struggle against sin to fight back that old human nature. I, like a king, I need to be out there doing battle with it, just slashing away at it um, with the full armor of God that I'm provided, that God provides me. Um, but also in this life, it's not even just for myself. I see that in the world around us. We have job descriptions all the time. Lloyd, I mean, electrician, you know what an electrician is. You go on and you, you become an apprentice and eventually a journeyman and, and you, you learn the trade. Um, you know, there's a builder, you know, construction worker, a medical doctor, a physician assistant, a, a nurse practitioner, all these, they have different names and they have different job descriptions. I think about, you know, I'm, I have a Dutch heritage 
and I am, uh, last name is Wagonmaker, aptly named, my ancestors made wagons. Uh, that, that name, that job description name is still with me to this day. To my knowledge, Lloyd, I have not made a wagon. In, well, in my life. The, the wagon market isn't what it once was, it, so I guess that's true, somewhat yes, that's understandable. Right. Very, very true. <laughs> it's not aren't, the demand for a wagon. They're, and they're Volkswagens, so, <laughs> you know, I guess they're, they're, they're those kind I'm of wagons. not sure around. that's Dutch. Uh, yeah, it's, it's more of a German, German, German ask. But, uh, yeah. but the, the Dutch, but my ancestors straddled the border between Germany and the Netherlands, so oh, you got to give okay. me a little bit here, Lloyd. Oh, okay. Give so me a little for bit. For the Volkswagen? Yeah, for the Volkswagen. And how many of those have you... Put I've together? driven. I've driven a Volkswagen. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, a Jetta. Okay, it, it was. It was That's a really true. Good one. I remember I the Jetta. Yep. Winter tires on that thing was amazing. Actually, they <laughs> couldn't leave the road even if I was on a sheet of ice. That was an amazing car. But still, not quite the wagon. But I did not make it. Sadly, no. I put gas in it. Um, <laughs> yes. So I put air in the tires. But <laughs> yes, I did. I, so my name, wagon maker. I have not really done a good job of living up to that name, that no. job description. On there, I'm glad I have the name, but I don't live up to it. But I also have another name, Lloyd, named Christian. Um, that one's not my legal entity name, where I fill out a job description. You know, when I was younger, and you had to list your your name on there. Um, but Christian is really my ultimate name, my the name of my identity. And so the question comes, and the question comes for all of us, and and it challenges us. Question answer thirty two of the Catechism: How are you doing living up to that name, to that job description of that name, the name of Christian, um, being a, a follower of Jesus Christ? Because it says, "By faith, I am a member of Christ. I belong to Christ. His name, I'm a little Christ. I'm a, the, the name of Christ is in me. Christian, Christian. I." It, and so how am I doing with that? You know, we have jobs. There are job evaluations. Sometimes as ministers, we get that too with our councils. They say, okay, how are you doing? Um, I'm sure you're just glowing all the time at Coopersville. All, all, all uh, the time, constant, sure. A, a wonderful <laughs> glowing uh, thing in Beaver Dam. It's glowing, of course. It's, of course. It's radiatingly so. Um, so, but, uh, so we get job descriptions in many ways. But then we think, well, how do I know if I'm really living up to that job description of being a Christian? Because that's what I'm called to do, confess the name of Jesus Christ, present myself as a living sacrifice, strive in good conscience against sin and the devil. How am I doing with that? Um, Jesus, in John chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus said this, remember the words, I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. Of course, Jesus is the master where the servants were associated with our master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. And so the name of Christ is on us. And so how are we treated? Uh, don't be surprised when you get persecuted for belonging to Jesus Christ and upholding the values of Christ's kingdom. On there. Don't be surprised if, you know, talk about a job evaluation. Don't be surprised if you miss out on a job opportunity because of your principles, your Christian principles. Um, you could say, for instance, I'm not going to work on Sunday. It's the Christian Sabbath. Fourth commandment is very clear. I shouldn't be working on, on the Lord's Day. And so that might mean you, you don't get that job or you don't get that job promotion. Is Some of these are the implications of, of our best, the supreme job which is the, the job of being a Christian, and, and it will have implications. But those can also be reassurances to us that I'm doing a good job. I'm, I'm, by God's grace, I'm living into this job um, because when I'm upholding his name, I'm getting pushed back. And when these others see Jesus in me, they can say, you are a, brush of, a breath of fresh air. You, you are, I, I see the love of Jesus Christ in you. The joy of Christ is just emanating from you. That is its own sort of job description, Lloyd. Yeah, and a Acts chapter eleven. I mean, the the first time that uh, those followers of Jesus were referred to as Christians, mm -hmm. we learned in Acts eleven uh, twenty six was at Antioch because they were following Christ's example. Uh, it should be we should stand out from the world. We should look like Christ. It shouldn't just fit in and gloss over and and every look the same as everyone else from our setting, those who are Christians, we should stand out as such. Yes. And 
especially in our day where it seems increasingly the culture has become is you know we're living in a post-christian culture and world here in the United States that that is one of the realities that we're going to face and, and Christians have to face before we you know when we were more of a Christian conformed sort of society we didn't stand out so much because I mean you could even have let's say blue laws on the book stores were to be closed on Sunday for instance or the you know when people would take God's name in vain it was it was chastised or even for vulgarities you it was expected that you would have proper language certainly in public and you wouldn't talk like a pirate and uh, with foul language for instance or even ethical business practices not that we got everything right because we have glaring problems and sins in our own nation's history and in in many ways but but in many ways, it was also easier to kind of fall into the rhythm of being a Christian because we were conformed more to the Ten Commandments it was on our courtroom walls. Now that's not the case, and now in many ways, as Christians, we are going to stand out. We're going to be countercultural. We have to be. We have to be comfortable with that. Right. We have but to be willing to to stand out. And yes. Stick out like a sore thumb and not go along with the crowd. And you know, uh, in. Uh, junior high or so high school we all have opportunities to uh understand what that's like to be with the crowd do the things that the crowd are doing and those that stand out get ridiculed or or mocked at times and they feel left out and disconnected as god's people in a society that is increasingly turning away from his commandments those are the sort of feelings that we need to be at peace with and recognize hey I know who's on the throne. I know that he is the one who is continues to to guard me and keep me in his freedom. And so I have and so that will give us peace even as we stand out a little more and find a little harder winds to sail into in in the world around us. We still recognize I belong to Christ. And the and the joy of that is even if the world may assail me, Lord say 12, question answer 31, which we just looked at with Jesus, because he's king, he is someone who guards me and who keeps me. And so let the world deride or pity, I through grace, a member am, a member of Christ and his church. And that is one way that God, you know, Jesus Christ keeps us through the promises of his word saying, I will not leave you, I, I will not forsake you. And in fact, Jesus, he speaks in John chapter 15, when he talks to the disciples, you're going to have problems in this world because they hated me, they're going to hate you. But then he talks about, but I'm, I'm going to send you the counselor. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father. So he speaks about that, and then you're going to testify to me. He's going to give you that power, but there's that reassurance. We belong to him. What can man do to me? Um, ultimately, it gives us that confidence, right. and to live into this calling to be a Christian. Hopefully, we, we as Christians, continue by God's grace to kind of rise to that challenge and to equip the next generation, right, uh, to do that, to know their job description yes. and to to live into joyfully live into that name of following following Christ. So, so that's what we have going on here in Lord's Day Twelve, Tyler. Okay, this uh, this job description as you laid it out what Christ has accomplished on behalf of his people, and who he is for us in this role as the Christ, the Anointed One, and what that means for us as his followers. Uh, as the as we're continuing to work our way through the Apostles' Creed, uh, I think we're going to have a bit more to discuss about who Jesus is, though, and uh, what all he's accomplished. So that's where we'll pick it up in uh, our next episode. Thanks for joining us on the Three Forms Podcast, a joint ministry of Beaverdam Christian Reformed Church and Coopersville CRC. To contact us, feel free to reach out through our Facebook page, Substack, on YouTube, or email us directly at threeformspodcast at gmail.com. Three Forms Podcast, walking the good and trusted old paths together.